There we go. So Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And what or who are these these? <laughs> uh, is Jesus asking John, does do you love me more than the other disciples do? Uh, do you love me more than you love them? Or do you love me more than you love these things around you, this fishing gear, for uh, for example? The Greek, the Greek grammar is ambiguous. It could mean any of those. Uh, so uh, different commentators will take it different directions, and some will say, well, you know, it can mean all of those, depending on the reader. The point is, is still the same, that our love for Jesus needs to be above everything else. Uh, well, you can't really compare our, you know, directly compare our, you know, our love with somebody else's love for Jesus, uh, but we can compare our love with uh, our love for things, for example. Uh, that, yeah, the point, and the point is, yeah, that we should be uh, loving Him more. So Peter replies, "Yes, Lord," he said, "You know that I love you." And uh, some commentators point out, or probably, uh, I don't know, maybe all of them do, <laughs> that a couple of different Greek words are involved there. Uh, when Jesus asks, do you love me? He uses the word agapao, uh, or from the noun ver uh, version of that is agape. And so we're kind of familiar with that word. And Peter replies, you know that I love you, that he uses the word phileo, uh, which is, refers to a like a family love. That's where uh, we can see that in the city name Philadelphia, which means uh, brotherly love, uh, love for brothers. And uh, is there uh, a big, big distinction here? Well, Earlier in the Gospel of John, G uh, John has used these terms interchangeably. So it's difficult for us to say that, well, here he is intending to make a distinction when earlier he had not. He, he can talk about God's phileo for us, uh, you know, God's brotherly love for us. Uh, so, and... Uh, he, uh, otherwise, you know, he can refer to uh, the disciples loving agape, one another, and that's what you would think that would be brotherly love, too. But the words were overlapping in meaning, uh, and so they, sometimes they were synonyms. So it's difficult for us here to press a distinction when in other places it is, uh, they, they are used, can be used interchangeably. But still, uh, Jesus is trying to make a point, uh, you know, beyond that. So we uh, will we'll be looking for that, that as well. <laughs> any, any comments on those uh, the words? I don't know what you've heard from other uh, other places about uh, those. I know it's a, a couple of years ago, and I, Judy Mayada asked me about this particular passage, whether there's a distinction in those words for love. Any comments? That's Mike. Yes, yes, June. Yeah, the the note on the Passion translation takes uh, what says the word love there in fifteen is huba in Aramaic. Ah, going to and, a different uh, language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it means to set on fire or it's like uh, burning burning in love or affection. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, very, very uh, strong word then. Mm -hmm. Um, does it say, does it say that the uh, Aramaic word would be different for when Jesus said it and when for, when Peter said it? The translation says uh, Peter said, "You know that I have great affection for you." Ah, yeah. So, so Jesus says, "Are are you on fire for me?" Peter says, mm -hmm. "Oh, you know I have great affection." Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. Yeah, so it, I guess the idea there is that Peter's not quite comfortable saying he's totally on fire for Jesus. 
Uh, well, part of Peter's point is there that Jesus knows, already knows, how much uh, Simon, Simon Peter loves him. So why is he asking? Well, I think we can see a little bit of that in a, as, as we go on. Uh, and Jesus told Simon Peter, well, all right, since you love me, feed my lambs. And then verse 16, the second time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? You know, uh, almost the same words, but he, he leaves out the comparison more than these. Uh, that doesn't have to be repeated every time. Do you really have, uh, you know, an intense love for me? And, and Peter answers, yes. Uh, so Peter sees that as some, uh, at least some degree of synonym there when he was able to say, yes. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. Here Jesus has changed the words a little bit from feed to take care of from lambs to sheep, but the basic meaning is, is still is, you know, much the same, that he's kind of commissioning Peter to take care of people in the church, uh, whether it's feeding, taking care of, uh, oh, they're, oh, that's overlapping, uh, whether they're lambs, yeah, we could say lambs are new believers, sheep are older believers, uh, but, you know, both are in the church and both should be taken care of. But all right, then verse 17, the third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? So the question we might have is, why would Peter be hurt? Uh, simply because it was the third time? Or... Was it because he's using this word for love that Peter's not quite ready to use himself? Mm -hmm. I, either way can work. Uh, I think part of the uh, what what we might see here at work here is in this uh, the the fact that it's the third time and that Peter had denied Jesus three times. Here Jesus. Peter is reaffirming his love for Jesus now three times. And Peter was hurt because that, that third question reminded him the third time, you know, that he reminded himself of his own three time repeated failure. Uh, yeah. So it's hard for us to, know well exactly what would hurt Peter in that. Uh, either way, we might say, well, why, why is Peter so hurt? Uh, it's, in some ways, Jesus is re reaffirming Peter's role uh, that you know, he says, uh, well, you know, he's giving him a job. Uh, but uh, comments from you? <laughs> Is it almost like, like rubbing salt in the wound? It's like Peter was so <laughs> embarrassed by what he had done. Yeah. And no. not that being cruel, but it was like, dude, you denied me three times. Are you sure? <laughs> this is it. You yeah. really left me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Elaine. <laughs> yes, Bernie. Yeah, I've been thinking about this question of Jesus, uh, do you love me? Uh, Peter already said, I love you. Uh, it seems that just saying it is not enough uh, because love is something more just hearing it. It's kind of invisible usually. Like in this case, you have to show by action. You know, if you love me, show this you know, how can we see love? Like in my own mind, how do I see love without accompanying evidence or action? And in this case, it kind of shows that, yeah, yeah, you love me. If I say, I love you, what's that? Unless I really live it, right? Unless I acted on it. 
I think there's that when um, uh, John the Baptist, they were, they were wondering whether it's Jesus, this is the Messiah. Is this the Messiah? He sent his disciples and Jesus said, just tell him what I have done. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the proof of the pudding. Is that the right expression? I mean, the, the evidence is on action. Like I can say to my wife, I love you, but if I don't act on it, is that really love? So I think this is a good uh, explanation when Christ three times said, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. There's a corresponding action, how that love is going to be expressed. Yeah. Mm. That... Yeah, that makes sense. Uh... Yes, Jan. I've wondered if um, this was the first time that Peter was answering Jesus or having a, a really a one on one conversation with him since his resurrection. And I'm sure he was still embarrassed. And not and kind of wondering about how he how he was viewed, and um, and I, I always kind of assumed that the feed my sheep was the other disciples that he was kind of you know saying okay look after your brothers here uh, they need you they need your help uh, I, you know, I don't know what what he really meant of course but I, that's was always been sort of my assumption without thinking about it. But anyway, do you think he was, um, this may have been just a, the first time he, they were having a real intimate conversation with just the two of them. And he felt on the spot. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, he, he would feel on the spot with three times uh, the, this pointed question. Uh but he does respond, yes, uh, yes, you know, you, you know how much I, uh, I love, you know, whatever uh, meaning of the word love there is. Yes, you, you know that. Uh, he's like, so you, you know that. So why are you asking me three times? That's, uh, yeah, rubbing, rubbing salt into the wound. <laughs> uh, I Something that I just noticed, uh, actually, my wife noticed this. Uh, look back uh, up here, share screen again. We go back up to verse 14. We are told that this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples. And why is John counting? You know, in some ways, the readers could easily count them, but John's pointing it out, this this coincidence of third time and maybe drawing some attention to it in a subtle way. Uh, and as I, I noted earlier that that charcoal fire that they had, that word for charcoal is found only in the, uh, uh, when Jesus, when Peter betrays Jesus. So there's some kind of connection there. It's just kind of a, uh, well, it's not a tight one, uh, but yeah, there's there is some connection there. And even if we don't see that connection, we do see what Jesus is telling Peter to do. And, you know, if you love me, do this. This is how you're going to show your love to me by showing love, hel helping uh, these other people that I love. Uh Yes, for me. Is it also possible that the reason, <clears throat> sorry, the reason John said, mentioned the third time is because <clears throat> people at the time were also questioning Jesus, whether he is truly the son of God or he's the Messiah. So this is the third time he appeared kind of to me shows, hey, here's, here are witnesses. Here is an evidence truly that Jesus became alive again, kind of additional proof or evidence that he is truly come, he came from the dead, you know? Yeah. Uh, the different gospel accounts have several descriptions of how Jesus appeared to his disciples. And, uh, and some of them are in different places. And he apparently appeared to them more, more than just three times that John does report these three. And 
I get, and I, I think he seems to draw not just reporting them, but also draws draws attention to it that this is the third time. It's not just a, uh, just not just a series, but he points out that it's a series of three. But again, it's uh, yeah, it's not, it's not the kind of thing you can base a doctrine on. <laughs> it's just something that might make it literarily more interesting to provide some kind of connections there. So, yeah, Peter's told to take care of uh, the other disciples, uh, the sheep, which would include not just the other disciples, but uh, everybody who came to faith uh, you know, from through them. Uh, as he, as he met, had, had uh, referred to earlier in his uh, John 17 in his prayer, he talked about those who would uh, yet to come, yet would yet believe. So that's part of Peter's commission. Uh, and that's basically the commission, not just for Peter, but for any leader in the, in the church from Peter onward. It's not exclusive to him, but it's pointed out here for Peter. Verse 18, then Jesus gives a prophecy. And it's not just a it's, it's not just a simple prophecy. Hey, Peter, you're going to be crucified. He's <laughs> the way he says the prophecy is kind of makes it a little bit uh mysterious, uh a, a little bit of a riddle. Uh very truly, I tell you, he says in verse 18, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So the riddle is, mm, what, what does he mean by that? Tradition is that Peter was crucified and that he uh, requested to be crucified upside down uh, so that he would not, you know, he was not worthy of dying in the same way that Jesus did. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how the the medical uh, things would work, but I would suspect that somebody who's crucified upside down would die sooner than somebody who's who was crucified right side up. But whether that was part of part of Peter's plan or not, I don't know. But the legend says he was uh, uh, crucified upside down on an X X shaped cross. I think it's, it's that's if I remember that correctly. So verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So even in death, Peter would glorify God, uh, show that God is honorable. Then he said to Peter, uh, follow me. Same words he had used, you know, three years earlier. Uh, as like no matter how your life is going to end, whether it's difficult or not, your job is to follow me. That's kind of the summary statement for what a disciple does. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. So, so John was following along. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? So John reminds us of who this was. It would have been sufficient to say the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he's tie, giving it a stronger tie-in. Uh, when Peter saw him, he asked, "Lord, what about him? Uh, what's you know what's going to happen to him?" Let's hear a prophecy about that. And Jesus answered, "If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? It's like that's not in any of your business." Uh, you must follow me, regardless of what other people, uh, other people in the church, some of them, them will have blessings, some of them will have more severe persecutions. Either way, it doesn't matter. Our responsibility for each of us is still the same. We must follow Jesus. Uh -huh. And accept, you know, ex accept the... Uh, 
uh, the outcome of life that he gives to us, whether it's glorious or whether it's dishonorable. Either way, we follow Jesus. That's just a kind of a, a simple uh, principle of discipleship. Any comments? All right. Now, verse 23, because of what Jesus said, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. Now, Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? So here he's, he's repeating it. That sounds like this rumor uh, was... Uh, still circulating at the time that John wrote. And this that's why he addresses it. They might be thinking, well, some might think, well, John's going to live uh, until the return of Christ. Uh, and therefore they they might they, they might be thinking that. Another scenario is that uh, that John knew he was going to die and didn't want that to uh, disturb their faith. So he puts that in here to say, no, that's, Jesus never promised that I would stay alive. So don't, so don't let my uh, death, you know, bother, uh, it, you know, cause you to lose faith. Tradition says that John did live a very long time and died a, well, a somewhat natural death. Uh, but we don't know whether those traditions are accurate. That's all we have to go on. But it does suggest that there is some, some kind of rumor at the time uh, John was writing. Any comments? I think that's one, yeah. one, one reason that it is not safe to set dates, you know. <laughs> In so many in the news, you know, church leaders setting dates, and then it doesn't happen, and people get frustrated, and some leave the church. Never, you know, <laughs> never set dates. That's a lesson. <laughs> right. And in some ways here, then Jesus' response is applicable to those situations, too. Even if, you know, so-and-so got the date wrong, what is that to you? Follow me. Uh, it's, our responsibility is still the same. We are to follow Jesus. And yeah, we are to follow Jesus whether the return is near or far. Uh, that does not change the way that we should follow Jesus. I mean, we can pray that it's soon, but be ready for if it's not. <laughs> Uh, further questions there. Yes. Sometimes like you wonder, like Paul saying, I show you a mystery. We will be, when you talk about ri rising up, uh, Paul thought, thought that he will stay alive and meet Christ, right? Um, he didn't seem to also understand that uh, Christ did not set any date. But is there is is it that important probably that we should always have a sense of urgency, you know? Yeah, it's we should uh, always uh, make the best use of the time that we can, uh, as that's urgency. Uh, we don't we shouldn't be operating in panic mode. Uh, all you know, it, it's just physiologically not possible for us to do that, and uh, we don't stay up all night for five nights in a row just because we think it's, oh, everything's urgent. Uh, we have to be able to pace ourselves too. So yeah, there is a sense of urgency, but then there's also a sense of uh, that we are in it for the long haul too. So we, yeah, we balance those two. Mike, it seems like there's always been enough trouble going on in the world that people could <laughs> would always question, okay, is is something going to happen? You no, know, is this really the time of the end? Um, 
you know, all the wars and the earthquake, I mean, everything is always, there are always disasters going on. And so it can never, it all seems like there's it, things are sort of built in to keep us thinking urgently that, it, oh. that the time is short. Well, certainly it's short for each of us. Yeah, yeah, each of us, right. It could be. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, Jesus talked about the early wars and rumors of wars, but, you know, don't, you know, don't be alarmed. That those things have been happening all along. Uh, but there's still an urgency because, uh, you know, well, we not only you know, we we will die, but the people we hope to reach uh, will also be dying. So we would like to reach, you know, the ones we can, uh, you know, while we can. Okay, verse 24, kind of concluding things that near the end. This is the disciple, this is the disciple that Jesus loved, uh, who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. And we, who who is this we? <laughs> is, is this uh, some editor, you know, just kind of tacked on a comment at the end? Uh, that's... Possible. Some say that well, the you know the book had uh, various levels of editing, but uh, all of that is quite speculative. This could be the royal we, uh, where uh, one person writes in the uh, plural, first person plural, uh, for whatever reason, literary custom perhaps. I, I don't know. John doesn't seem to do that elsewhere. Uh, but anyway, somebody is it's kind of a vouching for, all right, this is eyewitness testimony, so we can count on it. That's that's kind of the translation of the verse. <laughs> verse 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If any if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the, even the whole world would not have room for the books that could, would be written. And there are exaggerations like that are found and occasionally in secular writings as well. So that's, eh, well, yeah. Anyway, there's, the point is that there's a lot more going on there that, uh, you know, we can't include it in the scroll. And John didn't have time to write it. We don't have time to read it. <laughs> it, would, it was just uh, too voluminous. Uh, he, he's kind of vouching for the fact that, well, I've just given you part of the evidence. There's lots more there too, but we don't have to, you know, what I've given you is sufficient. We don't have time to go through everything. You have to take what I have given you uh, and and use what's the right there already. That's enough. Is it? Yes, Bernie. Yes, sir. Is it possible uh, John started with this book in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh. And this one is kind of the last portion here, saying, is, is that connected somehow? I was wondering theologically, like introduction, kind of towards conclusion about this Jesus who has been there since the beginning, before the beginning, or what? <laughs> yeah, yes, that's some, uh, some you know, documents have that kind of literary technique. The technical name is the Latin word in inclusio, uh, but I I don't see that here. I don't I don't see a very strong connection between this whole world and the books. I don't see a strong connection with the, the verse you quoted in the beginning uh, was the word because uh, he didn't you know he's not using the word word. Uh, maybe maybe I'm missing uh, what you're trying to say there. Uh, yeah, either then it must be just uh, a figure of speech. Uh, the the term, even the whole world, the kind of hyperbolic. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I I I think that's a bit of a figure of speech, an exaggeration. Uh, but and literally, it would probably be true uh, that if we tried to describe in even if if we tried to put into words. Uh, even a 
a movie of, you know, a two hour long movie, how long would it take for us to describe all the details that we would see in that movie, whether the cloth was blue or whether there was uh, stitching uh, along the edge and those kind of details, we could uh, go into, uh, yeah, details, just bury, <laughs> we could bury the thing in details. And so in some ways, any uh, any life, any person's life could, uh, wouldn't have, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to write enough books for to describe any person's life in every detail. Uh, but of course, Jesus is has much more important <laughs> things in his life than we do in ours. But you know, John is still pointing that, hey, you know, that's, but I, yeah, I think he's saying, you know, there's lots of evidence, uh, but what we have, what I've given you is, is, should be enough. Any overall comments on the book of John? Thank you. It's great. <laughs> are, are you glad the end has come? <laughs> I would just like to say it's been wonderful to have no actual study guide. I've had a lot of study guide Bibles studies over the years, but this is probably one of the first times that um, we've just read through the scriptures and talked about it. Uh, it's really been a blessing. Oh. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs> now, now the, re the rest of the session this evening, will the study guide. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, we can do it both ways. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, that's uh, all right. No, no pre-planned questions going on there. Mm-hmm.